It's Wednesday Wonders, science fiction and fantasy on the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG-13, suggesting that children under the age of 13 should listen accompanied with an adult. The Leviathan Chronicles. An audio adventure. The story thus far. After being rescued from the frigid waters of Alaska, McAllen and Tully are brought to the city of Mumbai by Anton and Othello. During their trip, McAllen enters the strange sarcophagus she found in the Cedar Elm shipwreck, which activates her dormant leviathan genes that now make her an immortal. She is taken to a secret base deep under the city slums that is run by Sedgwick, her grandmother's butler, who reveals that he too is an immortal. Sedgwick tells McAllen the story of Evangeline Liefrick, the Earth's first immortal. He explains that all immortals are dependent upon Evangeline to renew their lifespan periodically. Evangeline uses this power to blackmail the immortals to conduct her evil bidding. A group of rebel immortals led by Sension has separated from the Leviathan Collective and now seeks to overthrow Evangeline. McAllen learns that she is the result of a genetic breeding experiment to create a being with DNA so similar to Evangeline's that it would retain her ability to renew the lifespans in other immortals. Sedgwick explains that because she represents a threat to Evangeline's monopoly of power, McAllen's life is in great danger. A war is now underway between the rebel group led by Sension and the Edeners who are still loyal to Evangeline. McAllen is caught in the middle. Tully remains in Mumbai and hopes to gain some clue as to the fate of his best friend, Oberlin St. Clair, whose whereabouts are still unknown. Meanwhile, because Kazunori Tanaka failed to accomplish the assassination strike on McAllen back in Alaska, Jason Sterling kidnapped his illegitimate but only son, Toshi. He now holds Toshi captive in his secret laboratory called Acheron. A plot, long in the works by Jason Sterling, is about to unfold. And now, Chapter 11, Butterfly Rising. Jason Sterling walked down the brightly lit corridor of Acheron. The demanding schedule of Operation Butterfly had kept him awake for the past 48 hours, but he still looked as alert and cleanly pressed as if he'd just stepped out of a suit fitting at Barney's. The possibility of the mission's success fueled his alertness. Sterling felt the seductive lure of delivering a crushing blow to a nemesis, one that had eluded him for far too long. Acheron was always a special place for Jason Sterling. Lying deep under Baker Island in the Pacific, he reveled in the unparalleled security it offered. No way to be seen, no way to be touched. It was originally devised as a skunk works lab exclusively for the use of the Black Door Group. It was their own special laboratory far from the prying eyes of their own government. Normally, the leaders of the Black Door Group operated independently of one another, but Acheron was one place they could commune as a group to test and implement the most controversial technology devised by humans. That was until the incident. The incident that had made Acheron the sole purvey of Jason Sterling. He smiled when he thought of it all and felt the uncharacteristic urge to reminisce. But more pressing issues forced him to suppress this urge. Operation Butterfly was now about to go live, but first, he wanted to make a quick stop by a very special part of Acheron, called the Weather Room. He wanted to speak to one of his very special guests. Hello, Toshi. Do you know who I am? You are the bad man. Now why would you say that? I brought you some fresh clothes to wear, and we'll have some dinner brought to you shortly. Teriyaki salmon with some mochi for dessert. I've heard you like sweets, don't you? You are the bad man. How mistaken you are for such a wise little boy. I want to see my parents. Well, I can understand that. But your father lacks the proper motivation. And your mother, she's too important to me where she is right now. But I have a different idea, Toshi. How would you like to help me? Why? What if I told you there were people that had a secret plan to conquer the world with their own species and replace all of the humans? I don't understand. Incoming message for Jason Sterling, Source, Asgard Station. I have to go now, Toshi. I want you to go to sleep after your dinner and get some rest like a good boy. I'll be back to check on you soon. 
Jason Sterling turned on his heel and left the weather room. He approached a thickly ribbed metal door and punched a ten-digit code into the keypad on the right. A retinal scanner activated, and Sterling placed his right eye into the beam of red light that emanated from it. He entered a large room that he affectionately called the Icarus Room. The room resembled a giant V, with two long corridors a hundred feet in length veering out from the center. The corridors were filled with mainframes and other cabinet-sized technology. A large command console sat at the center. It was comprised of a single chair in front of eight large flat-screen monitors. Above the chair hung a horrifying device. The device resembled a demonic spider constructed of gleaming stainless steel with sharp iron-like protrusions resembling eight legs hanging limply from its body. It was suspended by a dense web of wires and cables that ran from the body of the device up to the ceiling. Jason sat in the center chair and pressed the green message light that was blinking on his console. Are we ready to commence the operation? I wouldn't have contacted you if we weren't. And the enforcers are ready for delivery? They are. But the real question is, are you ready? You will be controlling two minds simultaneously. The human brain is not designed to accommodate multiple sets of consciousness. You know that you are risking insanity. I'm well aware of the risk, but I do find it ironic that the source of such advice is a doctor who has been condemned by every major medical ethics board in the free world and is wanted for murder and forms of sadistic torture in five countries. Those charges were never- For God's sake, you are combining human and animal DNA. I heard you created a man with hooves and fur and face so disgusting that it died banging its head into a concrete wall. They were for the good of all humans. You created monsters. You want monsters. That may be true, but at least the enforcers won't know what they are, what they've become. You've seen to that, haven't you? As I have said, the human mind is not a hard drive that can be erased with a single keystroke. But yes, when Operation Butterfly commences, you will have full transference. What is left of their minds will be linked to yours. You will be able to control them as if you were controlling your own body. They will be, in short, your proxies in violence and hell. Have you been doing the mental exercises I prescribe for you? I have, and I ingested the last dose of the Xanatasium exactly one hour ago. Very well then. I will expose the enforcers to their final dose of radiation. This will bring them to maximum power, but will begin the countdown of their lifespan. Jason, you are aware they cannot survive long at this energy threshold. As long as they survive long enough to accomplish the mission, then I have no further use for them. Of course. The grotesque metal spider hanging above the control console descended until it hovered inches above Sterling's head. The sharp metal legs suddenly sprang to life and shot outward. And then, as if calming itself, it lowered one final inch and gently closed its legs until all eight protrusions were resting against Jason Sterling's skull. All right then, Doctor. Commence the final radiation burst. As soon as night falls and their consciousness is fully transferred, I'll have a modified B2 available for rendezvous. Let's see if McCallan Orsel is afraid of butterflies. Back in Mumbai, Tully was sitting on the stoop of a dilapidated building, located on a dirty cul-de-sac. McCallum rounded a corner and ran towards him. Tully, where have you been? What the hell are you talking about, where have I been? I've been holed up in this guest house they shoved me into after you disappeared into that pottery shop. That was no pottery house, Tully. You're not going to believe this, but it's a front for the Leviathan Group, or at least a small portion of them. They have a fortress hidden deep beneath this slum with enough high-tech gear to launch a space shuttle. Are you serious? Dead serious. Walk with me. I'm starving. McCallan gave a quick nod to the two men that were obviously standing guard outside the guest house. To the casual observer, the two might have seemed like two peasants playing a dice game in the dirt. But by now, McCallan was starting to recognize the physicality of the Kumbar potters that had sworn their allegiance to the Leviathan rebels over 400 years ago. The two men stared back at McCallan as if they knew her, and gave her an almost imperceptible nod in return. I must remember that nothing is what it seems on the surface. My survival may depend on it. What did they say about Oberlin? Do you think there's a chance he may still be alive? McCallan's heart sank. She realized that she was so overwhelmed by the revelation that she was now an immortal, that she had forgotten to inquire about Tully's best friend, Oberlin Sinclair. She bit her lip and regretted the words as soon as they left her mouth. They said there's a good chance he's still alive and they're working on trying to locate him. That's great! 
That's great news. How long until... Uh, Tully, watch where you're stepping. You almost knocked over somebody's water for the whole day. I'm sorry. I, I just... These goddamn streets are so crowded. And everything is just so out there. Look at that guy. He's in the middle of the street in a dentist chair. Looks like he's getting a tooth pulled. That guy there, he's just taking a shower out of a bucket in front of everybody. It's it just... It's just... McAllen and Tully continued their walk through the slum of Dravi. The smells and sounds of so many people was an assault to their senses. Corrugated tin structures lined the dirt streets. Wires and cables crisscrossed like a spider's web under the hazy sky. Stacks of cooking oil tins were piled high as a woman in a blue sari fastidiously cleaned and prepared them to be sold for recycling. Sounds of metal being pounded, cut, scrapped as well as shouts of anger and laughter enveloped McAllen. Young children pulled at her shirt tails, begging for candy, money, anything. Some of the children smiled at her pleadingly, but others shouted angrily. But at least the children could walk. Some adults couldn't. They lay on the dirty street, some missing limbs. Others looked too weak to do anything but hold up a plate with a few coins on it as McCallum passed. But her thoughts were interrupted by the sight of an elderly white couple. They stood in the middle of the frenetic, crowded street and stared intently at McAllen. They looked truly ancient, pale and clearly out of place in Dravi. She wondered why the children and beggars weren't soliciting the couple. But more importantly, why weren't the couple doing anything to help those in need around them? Man, it's really tough seeing all this. I may have lost my boat and all my money, but, but I'm starting to realize that I'm not so bad off. I'm feeling pretty grateful for the things I have right about now. I mean, look at the poverty here. How do you even begin to make a dent in it? I don't know the answer. Maybe just tackling it one person at a time. There's probably a million people in this slum. You sure you got the time to have one-on-one -on -one sessions with every tin scrubber and crate loader in this whole city? As a matter of fact, yes. Yes, I do have the time. What are you talking about? Tully, what's happening to us is real. I can feel it. So what's your point? My point is, I have time. Even if a problem takes a lifetime to solve, I have many lifetimes at my disposal. Whoa, you're starting to make my head spin, and I think you're getting way ahead of yourself. What do you mean? Isn't there supposed to be some killer radiation signal bouncing around the Earth killing all of you immortals? Yes. Sedgwick said each blast supercharges the immortal cells until you literally overload and die. That's why my grandmother was hearing voices. Her ability to telepathically commune with the other immortals was overloaded, so she had By the, the time they had reached Mahim Crossing, McAllen had recapped the events since entering the kiln and retold the story of Evangeline Leifrick and the origins of the immortals to Tully. I'm still finding it a little hard to comprehend. I did too, but it's starting to sink in. What is? The fact that... Oh, Tully, how about this place? Let's eat in here. Uh, I don't know. It looks kind of dirty. Come on, Tully. The place is packed. I'm sure all these people aren't eating here and getting sick. Yeah? Well, I've got kind of a glass stomach. <sighs> then I'll be here to pick up the pieces. Yeah, all right, I guess. I'm so hungry I could eat a cow. <laughs> Not in India, tough guy. Meanwhile, 30 miles off the coast of Mumbai, a B-2 stealth bomber lowered its altitude to just 400 feet over the Indian Ocean. Does someone mind telling me what the hell this mission is about? Charlie 1, this is Camelot Shadow. The mission is now granted to activate package sequence. Maintain altitude and proceed to coordinates 19.30 by 72.52, where you will release the cargo. Wait a second, that's directly over Mumbai. What the hell is this cargo anyway? You will follow instructions, Charlie 1. Priority Black Door 34 Omega. All information from this point is considered classified. Spectre level. Information is strictly on a need-to-know basis. You will follow your given orders and proceed to the coordinates, Lieutenant. Yes, yes sir. Now approaching new coordinates. What are your instructions? Open the bomb bay doors. But sir, no ordinance has been loaded. Just some cargo. Any further questioning of your directors will be considered treasonous and subject to court-martial. I remind you, for the last time, Lieutenant, this mission is classified. Priority Black Door 34 Omega. You will follow your orders, Lieutenant. Yes. Yes, sir. Inside the cargo bay of the specially modified B-2 plane, the cabin was empty, except for an enormous wooden crate that measured 20 feet on each side. Suddenly, 
The wood on the front side of the crate exploded into splinters as two 12-foot behemoths burst out of the container. They resembled human men only slightly. They had two arms and two legs, but each of their limbs was more than a meter thick, making them almost as wide as they were tall. Inhuman muscles rippled from every inch of their bodies, and their skin was almost entirely blood red. Their entire bodies pulsed ferociously with aggression. Their lips, nails, and knuckles were covered in a sharp, bone-like crust. As the two gigantic monsters took a single stride to stand at the edge of the open bay, the entire plane shuddered with their massive steps. Whoa! Something came loose in the cargo bay! I can feel something moving! I have to increase altitude. Maintain your heading, Lieutenant. Deployment is about to commence. Each of the enforcers stared straight down at the ground 400 feet below them. Skyscrapers passed just underneath as the plane entered the airspace over Mumbai. After quickly maneuvering around the city center, the plane came above the mangroves of the Dravi district of Mumbai. In perfect unison, the enforcers each took one step forward. The enforcers fell over 400 feet and created small craters where they landed. But in an instant, they pulled themselves out of the ground and started running towards the center of the Dravi slum. Each step was again in perfect unison, as one enforcer was the mirror image of the other. The two shimmered with unearthly power, as their master knew that their prey was near. Nothing would stand in their way. So, let me just get this straight. Evangeline Liefrich was a woman in the early Middle Ages who nursed two stranded aliens back to health. In exchange, they altered her DNA so that she can absorb the energy in these star stones, thus re-energizing her body and making her immortal. And because she's the only one that can unlock a star stone and harness its powers, every other immortal on the planet has to depend upon her for their energy feeding once every couple decades, otherwise they die too. That's right. But Evangeline has gone nutso and is blackmailing her immortals into only doing whatever she wants. Something having to do with her fulfilling the Eden Initiative. Cedric said she's done horrible things, Tully. The immortals have to commit murder, treason, give up their children, and give billions of dollars a year to her. Although, I have to admit, it doesn't seem like these immortals are hurting for money. Yeah, that stands to reason. Think about it, if you could stick a few thousand dollars into a savings account and let it compound interest for a few hundred years, you'd be a billionaire too. My god, Tully, you're right. And Evangeline didn't start with a few thousand dollars. The whole idea behind her immortality was to start the Eden Initiative, which was supposed to take a fortune back a thousand years ago. I don't know where all that money is or who's controlling it, but by now that money is probably in the... Geez, probably in the hundreds of trillions. That's why Sension can afford a string of townhouses in Manhattan. Not to mention my grandmother. That's how the rebels could pay for a secret fortress under Mumbai and buy everyone in the slum off for their silence. I don't know. I'm, I'm looking around here, and it doesn't look like anybody got bought off. No, Tully. Cedric said only the Kumbar Potters are, and they don't get any payment. The rebels have agreed to take care of the Potters' children in perpetuity, paying for college, housing. Think of it. What if you could give your life to a cause knowing that all your descendants would be provided for? Amazing. I think you're asking the wrong question. What if you could have untold riches and live forever to enjoy it, but you had to be a slave and beholden to a madwoman? That's the question I'd like answered. Tully, do you realize how much money the Leviathan Group must control? It must be close to 5 to 10% of the world economy. Maybe more. That must be why the Black Door Group wants to eliminate the immortals. Black Door? Those are the guys who Cedric thinks captured Oberlin. Before McAllen could answer, a waiter approached the table. Good afternoon. What can I bring for you today? I'll have the chicken tikka. Oh wait, you have masala dosa. That's my favorite. I'll have that and a Diet Coke and some basmati rice. And you, sir? Um, yeah. Can I get like a, a turkey sandwich? Like on toast or something? Uh, turkey? This I do not think we have, sir. Maybe you have a lamb korma. Uh, whoa, whoa, that's not spicy, right? Because if I get too much curry, my ass is gonna... What was that? I don't know. Sounded like some demolition. I think it's pretty late in the day for that. This place is remarkable. I've never seen people work so hard for so little. Every hour of the day, someone is... 
Shit, that's getting louder. Tully, I can feel the ground shaking. It can't be an earthquake, can it? Tully, what the hell is going on? Maybe it is an earthquake. Possible, but not likely in this part of the world. Maybe it's a terrorist attack. In a poverty-stricken slum? I don't know. Either way, we gotta get the hell out of here. Let's hurry. This building isn't gonna stand up for long. The entire back wall of the diner shattered. Oh. Two hulking 12-foot giants ripped the corrugated tin off the roof. Their red bodies and faces turned towards McCallum. In perfect unison, they both lunged for her, but Tully yanked her arm hard, getting her out of the way just in time before their giant fists pulverized the wooden table they sat at seconds ago. What the hell are those things? Come on, we gotta move. Now. Move! Tully pulled McAllen out of the diner onto Mahim Crossing. Chaos had erupted on the streets and terrified people were running everywhere. McAllen looked south down the road and saw a trail of rubble a mile long where houses stood only minutes ago. Don't let go of my hand! I can't believe that they- The enforcers smashed a load-bearing beam, causing the entire diner to collapse in a heap of rubble and ash. The two enforcers leapt out of the ruins with smoke and dust trailing behind them. They rapidly began scanning the crowded streets for any signs of their prey. They can't find us if we hide in the crowd. Duck your head down. You're a foot taller than everyone here. We've got to try to blend. Tully! It only took the enforcers seconds to find McAllen and Tully. The two ducking Caucasians trying to conceal themselves in a mob of Indians were easily spotted. But as the diner had collapsed, a telephone pole had been uprooted and fell downwards right as the enforcers were about to pounce on McAllen and Tully. The thick pole impeded their massive legs just enough for them to stumble for a brief instant. Tully could see by their speed that there was no hope of outrunning these demons on foot. A young man on a Honda 125 Wave motorcycle was racing by Tully trying to get away from the horrific carnage that was ensuing around him. He just got by Tully's right side when an elbow was brought up sharply, breaking the cartilage in the man's nose and knocking him to the ground. Tully felt horrible about striking the man down, but he needed the bike. Come on, get on quick! Where are we gonna go? We're gonna get the hell out of here, that's for sure. Just get on the back now. Tully picked up the Honda and McCallan ah! jumped on the back. She almost fell off when Tully gunned the throttle, launching the bike into the frantic of the crowd way. of people that were running Move. for cover. Okay, Ms. Immortals, do you mind telling me what in the holy name of God are those fucking things trying to kill us? I have no fucking idea, Tully! McCallan looked over Tully's shoulder and could see the speedometer showing almost 50 kilometers per hour. The rear tire of the bike started popping off the ground, and McCallum realized the massive footsteps of the enforcers were shaking the ground beneath them. They're getting closer, Tully! Hang on! Tully yanked the handlebars left, sending the rear tire skidding out violently as they slid onto Jakara Street. The pursuing enforcers had too much momentum to turn 90 degrees so sharply they tripped over each other trying to catch the fleeing motorcycle. Quickly recovering, the enforcers leapt to their feet and resumed their pursuit. The perfect symmetry they had displayed earlier was still maintained. We can't shoot! Them. Forget shaking them! How do we kill them? Look out! A small pickup truck moved across the oncoming intersection. The bike's brakes locked up. He nailed the throttle, unlocking the rear wheel and duped the bike hard right and then yanked it back left, narrowly missing the pickup truck. Tully! The brief application of brakes allowed the enforcers to gain significantly on McCallan and Tully. The tips of their shoulders and arms scraped against the sides of the shantytown buildings, collapsing some and severely damaging others. McCallan could feel the ground vibrating again as their powerful strides grew closer. Suddenly, in one swift jump, each enforcer leapt violently at the speeding motorcycle. The first enforcer crashed into the ground in an eruption of mud and dirt, smothering two people. The second reached out just far enough for three of his fingers to dig into the spokes of the rear wheel. The Honda instantly jackknifed, hurling McAllen and Tully through the air. McAllen landed against a wheelbarrow that had been abandoned while Tully hit the ground hard on his side and slid over 30 feet. Are you okay? No, oh, it's my leg. I think I really broke it. Tully tried to rush to her side, only to realize he couldn't breathe. Uh, my ribs. Uh, I must have cracked a bunch on my right side. Ah! Uh. Tully painfully forced himself up to his feet and stumbled over uh, to McAllen. Here, take my hand. I can't. Yes, you can. You want to die here? You want these fucking things to rip you apart and get on your goddamn feet? Ah, uh, okay. I'm trying. I know it hurts, sweetheart, but if you can stand on it, it's not broken. Uh, it hurts so much. I know, I know, but we gotta keep moving. Tully, look! The enforcers were both rising. McAllen noticed they were not moving in perfect unison anymore. Could this be the first sign of weakness? Quick, down the alley. McAllen threw her arm over Tully's shoulder and the two of them ran with all their strength. McAllen didn't need to look around to be able to feel the enforcers approaching. These things won't stop. These 
these things just won't stop. The two ran down the darkened alley, their bodies aching. They desperately looked for some doorway to hide and escape their killers. It's a dead end, Tully. It's a dead end! I know. Maybe there's a way to... But it was too late. The light in the alleyway dimmed as the enforcers slowly rounded the corner off the main street and walked towards them. They stared malevolently at McAllen and Tully. There was no need to hurry because there was nowhere left to run. The two giants walked in unison again, and Tully began to walk backwards with McAllen. McAllen lost her footing with her bad leg and was sprawled on the filthy pavement. Tully was at the end of the alleyway which was sectioned off by a chain-link fence. The enforcers flexed their stone-like hands ready to envelop and crush them. Open fire! Anton and Othello, flanked by six other Kumbar soldiers, opened fire at the enforcers. They each had M134 miniguns, while the three soldiers on each side carried AK-47 assault rifles. Aim high. Don't hit McCallum. The entire entranceway to the alley was blistering with fire as thousands of rounds were shot off at the enforcers. Tully dragged McCallum closer to him at the very end of the alley and covered her head with his chest. The enforcers' faces had gone completely slack as if in shock that anything could wound them. Once again in unison, they each fell to their knees. Bits of flesh and bone popped off near their shoulders and liquid was pooling at their feet. Swiftly, in a flash of movement, the enforcers whipped their giant bodies around and launched themselves at their attackers. They flew through the air with their arms crossed in front of them and then violently snapped them out with... Othello took the hardest blows, thrown in the air 150 feet away, landing on one of the roofs. Anton fell back just in time to avoid the enforcer's massive fist that rained down on him. The outer Kumba guards managed to jump aside and fall on the blows, but the other guards were not as lucky. The enforcers rose high again and punched down with such force that the skulls of the guards exploded in a wet gush before their heads were ripped from their bodies. The last two guards were thrown against the building walls like limp dolls. This is our chance. We've got to get up. There's a fire escape on the left. If we climb up the fence, we can probably reach it. McAllen and Tully sprinted to the top of one of the shantytown roofs. Fear like McAllen had never felt before fueled her body as she ignored her injured leg. As soon as they both climbed to the roof, they realized that stealth would no longer be a part of their escape. The metal roofs banged loudly with each footstep they took. They ran from rooftop to rooftop, carefully jumping wherever they could. Wait, Tully, wait! No, we gotta keep moving, McCallum. If we... No, 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 I mean, I've got an idea. We gotta head east from here. take us towards the outskirts of Duravi. No, we gotta stay where it's populated. Maybe we can find some sort of structure that we can hide in. We'll never stand a chance on foot against those guys, especially with your leg. I agree. That's why I've got a plan. Trust me, Tully. Trust me. Your plan better be good, because here they come. The enforcers heard McKellen and Tully's footsteps banging on the rooftops. They leapt in the air and grabbed the edge of a rooftop. The metal ripped off from the strain of the 1,400-pound weight placed upon it. McAllen and Tully were light enough to dance on the rooftops, but the enforcers were too heavy to be supported by the roofs of the shantytown. They continued to smash through the flimsy structures and would jump as high as they could to see which way McAllen and Tully were heading. By staying out of the enforcers' constant eyesight, the two were picking up crucial distance that McAllen needed if her plan was to work. As the building density became sparse towards Dravi's outskirts, they came upon a leather tannery where giant thick pools were filled with noxious liquid to impart color to the raw hides. The two leapt down from the roof and landed on top of a large pile of skins. God, this place is disgusting. The smell. It's like formaldehyde and feces mixed together. Just breathe through your mouth. I need your strength to make this work. Make what work? Less than two minutes later, McAllen and Tully were screaming at the top of their lungs. Help! Hey! Somebody help Over us! Over here! Help! Help! Hey! Hey! Okay, Ms. McCallan, now what? Now, we wait. McCallan and Tully stood nervously in the empty tannery, but needed no warning. As they approached the trapped pair, the enforcer's powerful steps reverberated through the ground, causing ripples to form in the pools of dye. Try to look scared. Hello. Are you method acting? 100 meters stood between the enforcers and McAllen and Tully. McAllen ran hard to her right to duck behind another pile of raw animal hides. Tully ran left to hide behind a thick post that supported a tarp. The enforcers began running over to each of them to knock away any obstacle that concealed them. Ow! McAllen and Tully sprinted out in an X pattern, running past each other where over a hundred animal hides had been placed out to dry. The enforcers ran furiously at McAllen and Tully. In an instant, they reached the point where the pair had crossed. 
but instead of taking their final steps to capture their prey, the two enforcers plunged downward into a murky brown pool of dye as the animal hides they stepped on gave way underneath their massive feet. The tiger trap that McAllen and Tully constructed had completely submerged the giant enforcers for over five seconds before they came up gurgling in fury. The monsters screamed in agony, clutching their eyes. Quickly, their reflexes became uncoordinated. They staggered back and forth, crashing into everything they walked into as they tried to rub the poisonous acidic dye out of their ruined eyes. This way! They can't follow us! McAllen and Tully ran to a wooden gate that led back out onto the main street. They opened the gate and were about to run through it when they both crashed into the body of a six-foot-six Gudrathi man. Step aside! No! Sedgwick stormed into the courtyard brandishing an MP5 machine gun. He was flanked by four other Kumbar guards. Each of the guards unloaded the arsenal they carried. Rockets streaked across the courtyard, striking the enforcers. Now, Anton. The condor swooped in low, directly over the tannery, and sprayed a yellow gel across the courtyard. The gel instantly ignited when it made contact with the air. Everything inside the courtyard, including the two wounded enforcers, became a horrid inferno. Cedric and his team just made it back to the entrance gate before the flames overtook where they stood. It was difficult to make out through the fire, but McAllen could see the enforcers groan with agony as their bodies became human torches. Suddenly, their bodies shuddered uncontrollably and the powerful enforcers began to liquefy until a small pool of bubbling residue remained where they had stood. What was that, napalm? In one of the most densely populated areas of India? Hardly, Mr. Tully. We are not savages and have been capable of far more sophisticated tools than a crude weapon used by the Americans 40 years ago. Both threats have been neutralized, Anton. You can initiate the extinguishment sequence. The condor flew back overhead and entered hover mode directly over the remains of the burning tannery. A small silverish globe descended about a foot or so from the belly of the condor. A bright flash of blue light radiated from the sphere. McAllen could see streaks of lightning permeating through the light, and she felt all the hair on her arms stand up. Instantly, the flames were extinguished, and only smoke trails and a putrid smell that would stay in McAllen's nose for days remained. Well, before I prepare dinner, McAllen, will you have any other surprise guests joining us? Jason Sterling was furious. He ripped the steel helmet from his head and flung it across the room, ripping it out of the ceiling sockets. There were eight small burn marks on his skull where the spiny contacts of the helmet had rested against his skin. He stood up. His head was spinning with confusion and fury. He stumbled to the small lavatory on the side and vomited forcefully into the toilet. He collapsed on the floor and lay there for over 30 minutes. When he finally used the sink to pull himself up, he was shocked by what he saw in the mirror. His eyes were completely blood red. There was a thick brown crust in the corners of his mouth that ran down to his chin. He tried to identify it as blood, but his eyes were having extreme difficulty focusing on anything. He stumbled back to the command chair and tried to push several buttons, but he couldn't make them out. The light in the room seemed unbelievably harsh. He had to get up again painfully and staggered to the light switch to dim the room down to near darkness. He returned to the computer console and found it blurry but more legible. He punched in the command sequence to contact Asgard Station. Samar Kane, Jason, what happened? Did you get McAllen Orsel? Is the rebellion neutralized? Yeah. Jason, I can barely see you. Can you turn up the resolution? It's very dark. No, no, I can't thanks to you. What the hell did you do to me? What are you talking about? This is what. My God, Jason. What the hell happened to you? I was hoping you could tell me that. W was there an attack on your station? Of course not, you imbecile. I'm 400 feet below Baker Island in the South Pacific in the most secure facility on the planet. Jason, what happened to the enforcers? The assassination attack was unsuccessful. The deployment went smoothly enough. The homing signal Wick placed within McAllen's coffee was still transmitting a tiny bit of signal. She was quick. A chase ensued. I was attacked with conventional weapons by the Rebellion's forces, but I dispatched them before they could inflict any significant damage. When I found McCallan and that Tully person again, they were hiding in some Indian tannery. They... they... splashed this... paint in my eyes. My god, of course. We made the Enforcer's bodies invulnerable, but the soft tissue was still human. They couldn't be easily hurt. But they could be blinded. Damn it, I'm blinded! 
the mental transference. You had complete control of their consciousness, but they must have died in so traumatic a way that the transference became two-way. They were intended to be the perfect proxy soldiers, allowing you to inflict the most harm while controlling them thousands of miles away, but But in you failed, plain and simple. Jason, this technology had never been tested. We bombarded their human bodies with so much radiation that the new cell growth was impossible to- Just know this. Your days may be as numbered as the immortals. I hope for your sake that when our day of reckoning comes, you will have found a way to make yourself useful. Jason, I... I... Computer, find me Wit Roberts. I think it's time to change our method of influence. Meanwhile, back in Mumbai... McAllen and Tully sat in Cedric's office deep under the Dravi slum. They were battered and filthy. Cold spring water had been brought to them while they waited for Cedric to return. The mood was sombre, and even the sight of Tully still wearing McAllen's pink sweater, now torn and filthy, failed to bring a smile to her lips. After another five minutes, Cedric quickly strode into the room without greeting McAllen or Tully. He made a direct line to his computer and punched a sequence into the keyboard. Senshun's face appeared on a monitor on the far wall. Report. The attack was devastating, Senshun. Worse than you've heard. Frankly, we've never seen anything like this. Over 60 dead. Hundreds have been injured. Make sure you control the press. I want witnesses planted and make sure that we tend to all the wounded. The local government needs to be kept out of this. Bribe or call in whatever favor you need to. Assure them that all the citizens of Duravi will be more than cared for. I understand. The authorities and media have already been informed that a microburst, a highly concentrated tornado, struck the Duravi section earlier this evening causing severe but localized damage. <sighs> Good. Now the more important issue, which is who the hell launched this attack on us? They knew about our base in Mumbai, and they knew about McAllen. The Mumbai base is running on reserve power, as all of our generating equipment was destroyed as those creatures charged through Daravi. I am very concerned that our operation here could become compromised by a cyber attack if we do not regain operational capacity soon. If this is Black Door's work, then we've substantially underestimated their resources. Only one thing could have created such powerful creatures. A star stone, I know. There's very little to go on, but we've identified traces of some sort of mutated star stone signal that was mingled with a type of gamma radiation. What kind, specifically? The cellular residue we found contained traces of radiation trauma consistent with exposure to an enriched uranium-zirconium alloy. But that nuclear fuel is only found within the reactors utilized on Virginia-class submarines. How does a star stone fit in? Obviously, we can only speculate. But it would appear that the nuclear reactor fuel somehow was exposed to a significant burst of star stone energy, some of which it absorbed. As a result, a perverted energy field would be created that would kill and mutate a human's genetic code, creating a sickening array of damage. But as the radiation from nuclear exposure would ravage the human's body and mind, the star stone energy would rush in and heal. It would be like being constantly killed and reborn simultaneously. I imagine it would be like a broken bone growing back stronger. The exact recipe of radiation must be virtually impossible to calculate, given the complexity of the variables. How could they possibly generate the number of volunteers necessary if to- this is Black Door's work, then my sense is they don't typically ask for volunteers. Was there anything else you could find? Only this. What is that? We believe it's a tooth filling. You're kidding. The curious thing is that it's constructed of an obsidian ceramic alloy that is virtually unknown. Of course, we've known about it for years, but almost no human process has been able to duplicate it. Only one company in the world has been known to have the technology to craft such a material. And which would that be? Nankatsu Industries in Tokyo. Sounds like we might have our first clue. Yes. Yes, I see. Of course, I'll inform the others. And that was the medical bay. Unfortunately, their efforts to save Othello have failed due to the severity of his injuries. The impact shattered most of his internal organs. He died on the surgery table five minutes ago. You have been listening to The Leviathan Chronicles by Christoph Leputka. For more episodes and information, log on to www.leviathanchronicles.com.
Hello, everyone. This is Christoph, author and creator of the Leviathan Chronicles, and you've just listened to Chapter 11. And I got to tell you, Chapter 11 is by far my favorite episode of the Leviathan Chronicles yet. It has taken us probably about four to five months to complete that episode because of the density of the sound effects and the music and the acting, and I could not be more proud. I feel like this is our showcase episode. If you're going to recommend Leviathan to a friend of yours, I don't want them to listen to Chapter 11 because in addition to think being a great sounding episode, it's also an episode that we took the most chances with in terms of what an audio drama, what a podcast could be. I wanted to have a balls-to-the-wall action episode, one that really imitated a lot of the action scenes you would see in a movie. And a lot of people were saying, well, that's not going to work. You're not going to be able to translate action into a podcast, into an audio drama. And it was just going to, a lot of people thought that it might be too hectic, too dense, too confusing to have all of these different sound elements going on at the same time. But I was really hopeful that we could do it. I think we have. I'd love to hear your feedback. If you like it, if you'd like to see more episodes like this, I think it's really fun. And and we want to take chances with the genre. That's what makes Leviathan Chronicles, I think, very special in that while we're inspired by a lot of the audio dramas that were created in the 40s, I'm not trying to imitate them. I'm trying to reinvent the genre for the 21st century a little bit more. And and go in some different directions than necessarily War of the Worlds, which is phenomenal and genius. But I, I'm not trying to imitate that. I'm trying to really create something something new and something different. If you want to send out some good karma, I got to mention somebody in this, Robin Shore, who is the main sound engineer working on Leviathan at Silver Sound. Send him a shout out. His email is robin at silversound.us. He has done an amazing job on all the episodes, but he's really killed himself on Chapter 11. Go send that dude an email. Tell him he rocks and tell him how much you've enjoyed what he's done. This is really his work, his masterpiece, and what he's been able to create. So this past week has been a really fun one for Leviathan. And a lot of that is due to one person, Megna Hazarika, who is a cousin of a very good friend of mine. And Megna helped us out in Chapter 11. She has uh, she adds some Hindi voices to, to the background. And if you speak any Hindi, there's a little hint of uh, kind of what's to come in future episodes. But uh, not only was she helpful in lending her voice in Chapter 11, but Megna is also part of an international marketing program um, that has classes in several cities around the world. And she's doing a program now in New York. And the leader of that group is a gentleman named James Cooper, who works at an advertising company called Another Anomaly. And their class project is called Celebrity Ping Pong. And their idea was to create an online magazine dedicated to Celebrity Ping Pong. Now, I don't know what drugs they're smoking, but apparently they think that I'm worthy of celebrity dumb. And I left work last week, I think it was on a Wednesday, and go down to this wicked cool loft down in Soho where they had set up this giant ping pong table. And I got to meet with some other members of Megda's class who were all absolutely terrific and were really curious and enthusiastic about Leviathan, about our recording process, about how the website came about, and really gave me some great feedback. And then, of course, uh, I tried to stall as long as I could because I was there to play ping pong. Not to make nice nice, to play cutthroat ping pong. And James and I uh, were going to play each other and James was going to interview me while playing me in ping pong. So the idea being that while you're focused on getting your shots in, serving correctly, you were going to give more off the cuff, more honest answers. And I got to tell you, I was sweating like a pig trying to get a point off of James. And and the story would be so awesome if I could say I came, I saw, I conquered, and I kicked James' ass. Unfortunately, the score was, I think, either 9 to 15. Um, may have even been a little worse than that. may have been 8 to 15. I'm not sure. But the point is I didn't win. And I wish the story had a better ending. I wish. But, uh, but James did beat me. But we really had a great chance to talk about the direction of science fiction, to talk about uh, the inspiration behind Leviathan and kind of where, you know, where we hope to, to take the project. So it was really a great experience. So much fun to be playing ping pong. They had a film crew there. Uh, I'm going to give you that website when the magazine goes live. It's not quite finished yet. But it was so much fun to be sitting there in Soho playing ping pong and being asked about Leviathan. Total pig heaven for me. So... We always try and talk about some of the other cool podcasts that I'm listening to and that I think you guys might enjoy. And one that has really knocked my socks off is a podcast called Playing for Keeps by Merle Lafferty. 
Playing for Keeps is a superhero story, which at first blush sounds like a little a little campy or a little corny. It is completely not that, and, and it really took me by surprise. The way that I listen to podcasts is usually on my walk to work. I live right by the United Nations in New York. My office is in Midtown, so I've got about a 20-minute walk, and, and I use that time to listen to other cool podcasts, listen to other authors I'm interested in. And within about 5-10 minutes of Murr's story, Playing for Keeps, I was really hooked and impressed by her ability to take a science fiction genre like superheroes and drill it down into reality. And it's a story about a fictional city called Seventh City where they have heroes, they have villains, but there's also a subclass of heroes that have superpowers but aren't quite good enough to be heroes. And it explores a lot of the the social tension that would realistically exist if heroes and superheroes and villains really, really did exist. And in a lot of ways, I think she's tapping into what's been a very common theme in science fiction, at least recently, which is this um, this draw towards uh, towards near future, realistic science fiction. And we see that happening with Batman the Dark Knight, breaking box office records. Batman is kind of uh, a great hero because it's not that he's necessarily a superhero. It's not that there's aliens. He is just a dude with enough money and enough time and enough resources to give him the equipment and the training necessary to to be Batman. And while it is incredibly unlikely, it is yet plausible in the world we live in to create a Batman superhero. And I think she draws on a lot of that, um, on that realism and the way that she portrays her characters and that superheroes sometimes have a class structure and there can be such a thing as a second rate superhero. And they go to bars, they drink, they've got problems, they've got their personal lives. And and I really like that aspect to it. In a lot of ways, it's what we're trying to do with Leviathan in the same way. Where Leviathan is focused on immortality, we're trying to also make it a very realistic portrayal of what immortality would be like. So I'd like to play a promo to Murr's podcast, Playing for Keeps. And what's really special about her podcast is that the podcast is being turned into a hard copy book that's going to be for sale on Amazon.com. It gets released August 25th. What Murr's asking everyone to do and what I'm asking everyone to do is buy her book if you like her podcast on August 25th. Not the 24th, not the 26th, but on the 25th because this is a technique used by a lot of other podcasters that are kind of making that transition into the print world where a concentrated buying effort in a short period of time, like on one day, really shoots the author up the ranking chart. So by getting all of your buyers to buy on one day, all of a sudden you can break the top 10 list in Amazon for a given genre. And I want to give Mer all the support we can. Her work is awesome. She's a fantastic writer. So without any further ado, this is the promo for Playing for Keeps. In a world where evil supervillains run amok and corrupt superheroes care more about their hair than justice, one woman is caught in a web of manipulation. Keepsy Branson just wants to run her bar. She doesn't want to think about her old dreams of being a superhero or her tired ambitions to save the world. But the facts remain that Keepsy and her friends have powers too, and they will soon be needed as Seventh City falls into chaos, and no one knows who are the good guys and who are the bad. Playing for Keeps is a free audiobook from Mer Lafferty, available at playingforkeepsnovel.com. All right, that was a promo for Playing for Keeps, and you can find that podcast on iTunes, or you can go to Mer Lafferty's website at merverse, M-U-R-V-E-R-S-E dot com, and check out Playing for Keeps, as well as some other podcasts that she's written. Her work is really great. I really recommend you guys check it out. So in other Leviathan news, I got a terrific surprise last week through the form of Twitter. Now, as with most things in life, I'm very late to the game. And calling me a tectard is a lot like calling Britney Spears' parenting skills inconsistent. An understatement at best. So I just got into Twitter as I got my new iPhone, which I totally love, highly recommend. And another prominent podcaster had sent a Twitter out to his Twitter community praising Leviathan. And all of a sudden, I got like 100 hits on the website just generated from that tweet. 
So what I'm asking everyone to do if you are involved in Twitter is to send people in your Twitter group a plug on Leviathan. Ask people to check out the site. And if you want to tweet me, boy, does that sound perverted. If you want to Twitter with me, uh, my tag is C Laputka, C-L-A-P-U-T-K-A. I'd love to make you part of my group. I'm new to Twitter. I don't have any Twitter friends. I want to be the most popular kid on the block. So definitely hook me up with Twitter. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about, a little bit off the subject, but something much close to my heart, is the USS Oriskany. What the hell is that? The USS Oriskany is now the largest boat ever intentionally sank for the purpose of creating an artificial reef. And there was a New York Times article about it that I'm going to put on the show notes on the website where it is 44,000 tons. That's almost 900 feet long. And before the Oriskany, the largest boat that had been sunk by the Navy was called the Spiegel Grove. It was an LDS, a landing dock ship, which was sunk off the coast of Key Largo that I got the chance to dive about three years ago. And, And that dive was a lot of the inspiration behind the scene with the Cedar Elm, where McCallan and Tully... Uh, take the submersible down and are able to look at this this enormous ship. And to give you a sense, the Spiegel Grove is 500 feet long, starts at about 60 feet, ends at about 150, 160. And I did the dive in the stern of the ship, which is really the staging area for the amphibious vehicles that they would launch out. So you're diving down into this giant loading bay with cranes and vehicles, and you can swim through the real house, and it's just incredible. And the size is just so breathtaking. You look down the side of the boat, and it looks like the boat's going on forever. And and that was really what inspired some of the descriptions, where it's almost like you had a flashlight, and you were looking at just a small portion of the boat. I think I've heard people say it takes them 10, 20 dives to see all of the Spiegel Grove. Well, the USS Oriskany is 900 feet long. It's 44,000 tons. It is just enormous. Imagine an aircraft carrier underwater. I've heard the top of the con tower is about 70 feet, and it goes down to about 200, 215 feet down at the keel. I can't wait to dive this thing. I'm going to try and dive it towards the end of the year. If I do, I'm going to get lots of photos, blog about it. You guys will be the first to know and share it with you. If anybody else has done the dive already, I know it's been sunk for about a year now. I'd love to hear your dive experiences, any advice, any thoughts you might have on it. If I do end up diving it, I'll give everybody a lot of notice. I'd love to organize a Leviathan dive trip. If you guys all want to go, I'd love to dive with you. We'll create a Leviathan dive gang. I think it'd be awesome. That is all for this week. Thank you guys so much for listening to chapter 11. This is really an episode that I'm so incredibly proud of. Thank you guys for listening. I will see you all in 10. There are a number of things that we can all do to help stop the spread of the coronavirus and protect ourselves and our families. One is simply to clean your hands often. Wash your hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after you've been in a public place or after blowing your nose, coughing, or sneezing. If you don't have access to soap and water, then make sure you use a hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol. And finally, avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth with unwashed hands. These are some simple things that we can all do to help protect ourselves and our families from the spread of coronavirus. Be well, everybody.